Last May, the Sports Business Journal and, and Daily named the Warriors the organization, uh, the sports team of the year. His impressive resume includes a number of successful organizations in many different types of roles, spanning virtually every level of the NBA franchise. Prior to the Warriors, he was nine years with the Phoenix Suns, serving the last two seasons as president and chief executive officer in Phoenix. Prior to the Suns, 17-year stint in, at the NBA League office in New York, where he ascended through the ranks to eventually become the league's third in command. A native of Seattle, Washington, his ties to the NBA actually uh, started in childhood. When he was 16, he worked as a ball boy for the Seattle Supersonics. He went on to spend 10 years with his hometown team, serving in a number of roles, including as the team's director of public relations during back-to-back -back appearances in the NBA Finals and the Supersonics NBA Championship in 1979. May 2011, front page story in the New York Times, Rick became the highest ranking executive in men's professional professional team sports to publicly acknowledge, acknowledge that he is gay. Four months later, he was presented with the U.S. Tennis Association, USTA's Icon Award that was in New York City at the U.S. Open. An exemplar of a Bay Area leader who embodies our high school's defining principles in so many ways. Please join me, join me please, in a warm welcome for Mr. Rick Welts. Thank, thank you, Rick, and thank, thanks for you and the whole team for giving uh, so many people just so much joy. That was, that was I'll, a lot of I'll fun. I'll pass that along to Steph Curry. There we go. <laughs> It had was. A more uh, to do with it than I did. It was. Uh, it was the kind of drama and narrative that gets us all involved. It was so exciting. Can tell us a little bit when you think about building, because you you built you and others, but you as the leader sort of built a championship organization uh, on top of this championship team. Tell us about the the organizational decisions you had to make along the way. Well, I, I think I had a big advantage uh, over most people who come into a position like that in that we, uh, by definition, were in the midst of a lot of change. Uh, the Warriors had uh, been purchased by a group of investors led by Joe Lacob and Peter Guber uh, almost five years ago now. Uh, and, you know, we were, we had a culture of losing. We had an expectation every year of losing. We expected it on the court in business. We, we were used to it. And you know that wasn't why Joe and Peter paid then the highest price ever paid for an NBA team. Uh, they, they really, in my first interview with them, I'll never forget, I, I never heard them use the word good. Mm. I only mm. heard them use the word great. Mm. And they convinced me that, that we would have the resources and the commitment at the ownership level to try to do something special. So uh, you know, listen, we, we, I think we're very open and transparent with the whole organization. We, we had to change the culture. We invited everybody to come along with us. We explained how we were going to do things. Uh, but that was a good point in time where, where if you could buy in and believe that we could be what we wanted to be, you were welcome on board. But if you weren't, it was probably a good time to leave. Mm -hmm. And we, we really changed over probably half the organization over the course of my first probably year and a half there. Extraordinary. Yeah. And that's... Um, it was on that topic, when we think about, a, it wasn't necessarily a culture of losing, but a culture of not winning, sort of, do we, do we understand how that happens, right? Well, uh, I'm a bit baffled, you know, in the NBA, more than half the team, 16 out of 30 make the playoffs every year, and the Warriors have missed the playoffs 17 out of 18 years. I'm not, I don't, I'm not really sure you could set out with that yeah. goal in mind and accomplish it. Yeah. So, uh, uh it was an extraordinary achievement yeah. that you wouldn't want to hang your hat on. But, but it, there are decisions you make every yeah. day. You decide yeah. how you're going to show up for work yeah. every morning. And you decide you know, what you're going to value in players in terms mm. of uh, not only their, their abilities on the court, but the character and what they bring to the locker room yeah. as well. And you're not going to make every decision correctly, but if you have a framework for those decisions and you stick to it, you have a better chance than not of eventually achieving the success you're yeah. looking for. Yeah. Well, it's a remarkable transformation. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, having achieved what you, you and the team achieved, what's, what's next? What are, does, does that create its own challenges, right? 
Well, I think it's, you know, it's been a really short, really busy summer. You know, our players uh, enjoyed it. Uh, a year ago, they were all in camp a month early on their own, you know, working out. This year, they all had so many commitments, they couldn't get here till really the first day of camp. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time talking with them, talking mm -hmm. to our own organization about, you know, not thinking like we've got this all figured out. You know, there, there was a process that we went through last year that yielded the ultimate result in our industry. But if we forget about that process and don't recommit ourselves to doing that plus this year, we're not gonna end up anywhere close to the same result. So, you know, I, I think we wanted everybody yeah. to enjoy what had been yep. achieved, but we also wanted to take a deep breath and say, you know, we have to have the same approach this year as we had last season. And, uh, you know, if we do that and we're committed to that, then, then we have a heck of a chance to, to repeat what happened. Outstanding. Outstanding. How, when, when you think about the, um, the, the culture, let's try and unpack a little bit mm -hmm. the culture of winning. And, and so as you, as you think about that shift, maybe could, could you give us a kind of um, a behavior or a norm or something specific where you said, I'm not saying enough of this. This is, this is what we're about. You know, on the, on the, it, it, it actually, I don't think it's that complicated on the business side. You know, my first day uh, in this job at the Warriors got the whole staff in a room like this and said, you know, there's certain things that, that we're going to commit ourselves to. You know, first is we're going to rejoin the NBA. For whatever reason, hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> we actually had decided, like, you know what, we don't need any help. Uh, and we have a crazy business model, if you really think about it. While we try to kill each other on the court. We have uh, an industry where I don't have to compete with another NBA team in my market. And we organize our markets in, in a way mm. that mm. we don't compete with other teams mm. in our market. So kind of duh, but it took a long time to develop uh, in, in all the leagues and it's developed more in the NBA than in any other league where we share every bit of business data. I know hmm. every dollar that comes into every team in the league, where wow. it comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, I can benchmark against what other teams are doing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if I'm, I'm not doing my job, if I'm not on the phone hmm. once a day with another team president saying, you know, we're thinking about this thing that we're trying to get better. You know, have you guys been through this? Would you share that experience? We have an amazingly collaborative culture that we had just shut out. We had said, well, like, we don't need to know. You know, we, well, we, got, we got this. Yeah. And you don't have this. Yeah. We're all facing exactly the same issues. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't mean we're going to do what any other team did, but the benefit of knowing how somebody else dealt with that leads you to a much better decision that's applicable in your particular you know, the, the yeah. particular thing that you're trying to solve. So that was one thing. The other, the other thing was, frankly, just from a, an ethical perspective, how we were gonna do business. You know, uh, I think the greatest freedom that anybody can have in an organization is to know that you're gonna conduct business at the highest ethical level and that the organization will always have your back and you will never be asked to put yourself in a, any kind of situation that makes you uncomfortable or compromised, and you know that was our commitment that mm. everybody there, we had the expectation and you had the obligation to Terrific. conduct business in that way, but the organization would always have your back uh, in doing that. And those were a couple of really simple things, but not necessarily the way the franchise had been run before. Outstanding, great examples, great examples, and then, then the sort of the the data that, that the teams were sharing, the analytics, you, you talked a little bit about your own background in media. Could you say a few things about kind of the importance of media in, in, in running a team like this and how your own background helped you to do that? Well, if you think, again, you think about what a crazy industry are, we are. We're a $250 million business. I mean, we would not show up in the top 200 companies in the Bay Area, yeah. right? But we have this amazing media presence because, uh, it's one of the last places where people still gather in great numbers to cheer on a common cause, even though these people don't know each other or, or have any, maybe anything else in common. And, you know, be, be, there's a still, you know, if daily newspapers, I think, still exist. So I think there's still a section in the daily newspaper and every newscast is kind of obligated to cover your company yeah. on an everyday basis, yeah. which is like an unbelievable advantage we have over right. other true, other it? industries. Yeah. Uh, so we don't have to, have to fight for that, it's more how we manage that and how we, 
you know, create a, a media strategy that, that tries to accomplish our goals, understanding that it is news and we're going to get reporters writing not nice things yeah. about it when we deserve it and people will not agree with every decision. And the one thing I know about every single one of you in here is you are an expert in my industry, right? I, li yeah. I like, I may not have any idea what you do, but you know exactly what I should be doing every day and what our coaches should be doing, what our players should be doing. So. You know, it's that kind of, you know, think about how easy it is for us to get people like this engaged in our yeah, business. Yeah. It's not like the phone company or, or you know, the oil or gas company right. that yeah. has to beg to try to get anybody to care yeah. about them. People have a passion for our sport. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you capture that and channel it in a way that, that is great for the fan and great for the business? Yeah, it's outstanding. You know, when people talk about sort of the, well, Mattering has always mattered in, in life and in business, but I think you know that sort of meaning and purpose and connection with people. It's got to be pretty, pretty inspiring for the people that work for and with you, huh? To know well, that, it wow, is. This yeah, gets, no, it's the reason we all do this. Everybody's right? going going nuts, and, and that's a it's great reason, thing. It's the reason we all do this. It's yeah. it's hard in life to raise a championship trophy. Yeah. Oh, you know? it's hard to reach that outstanding that achievement that Cynical. that everybody is going for. Outstanding. Could you say a few things about the stadium project in San Francisco, sort of uh, evolving? Yeah. How, how does the economics of all of that look? Do we have like what? Four, we have a long hours? time. We have like a we have long hours, time. It's like a that. big topic. Um, but it, it is absolutely the most fascinating, complicated, frustrating, rewarding thing I've ever been involved in. And uh, you know, to think about, I don't know what the, what in your life would be the equivalent, but the idea that, that you could take everything you've learned in every minute of your time in an industry and create something new, create a physical form that will be the greatest expression of that that's ever been done, or that's your challenge anyway. Like, how great is that? Mm. Like, to have that opportunity. It's a once, it literally it is. is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. and. Yeah. You know, there's, you know, our, the Bay Area is so unique in so many ways. One, it, you know, how is it possible that the city of San Francisco has never had a world-class multi-purpose arena? Now, three years into this, I think I understand uh, <laughs> what, why that's the case. It is incredibly hard mm. to do something of this scale and importance in San Francisco. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, we are, we're, we're close. Somebody asked me yesterday, like, you know, a football analogy, like, where are you in the game yeah, right yeah. now? You and know, are you on quarter. the, are are you you on the, the one yard okay. line? I said, well, I, I feel like we're at the 10 yard line with a first down right now. Yeah, okay. You know, we're, no, we have a lot of wind at our back, a lot of things going well, but it, it's come with pain. We announced, we announced more than three and a half years ago, I guess now, that we'd accepted Mayor Lee's invitation to bring the Warriors back to San Francisco, where we originally landed when we came from Philadelphia to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, and the mayor handed up a wonderful piece of public property called Piers 3032, which literally were crumbling piers over the San Francisco Bay. And we got caught up in a lot of the politics of waterfront development at the time. Yeah. And you know we had really reached a point two years ago where we were either gonna go to the ballot and mm. ask the voters, which wouldn't have done anything definitive, but would have given us maybe some political wind at our back. Uh, and right when we were making a decision about doing that, we got a phone call from Mark Benioff at Salesforce and said, I think I got, I think I got a better idea for you. I own you know, 12 acres of property in San Francisco's Mission Bay neighborhood that mm -hmm. I was going to build the Salesforce campus on. And mm -hmm. we have outgrown the campus, even though we fully designed it and we're ready to put a shovel in the ground, we're going to go a different direction. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark Benioff's a very philanthropic guy, but he's also a pretty good businessman. Yes, he man. sure is. So basically the deal was, look, I way overpaid for this land. I've got three, I've owned it for three years. Yeah. Uh, I paid for the architects to design my project. If you want to pay for all that, we have a starting point to talk about. Uh, but we decided we would do that. And yeah. it was really important because we shifted from public land to private property. Yeah. We shifted yeah. from over the water onto a land-based site. And the dynamics changed overnight. Yeah. Uh, the whole political Sense spectrum, approvals, all especially the, yeah. those, you yeah. know, the, my yeah. best friends now are the Art Agnos and Quentin Cops of the world who were our, our most steadfast opponents uh, Initially. Yeah. when we wanted to build over the water. We're polling hmm. unbelievably well in San Francisco. It doesn't mean, you can't do anything in San Francisco without opposition, so yeah. we still have opposition, yeah. but uh, the project that, uh, that actually, I, do you want to 
give a peek at the. This is actually. Yes, actually, that would be fun. This to is see. a premiere. No one has so, ever seen the animation yeah. that that we're going to show you right now. It's just a so couple no minutes. filming and tweeting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> The other most important element of uh, trying to get the finish line there is obviously the fact that uh, it is a 100% privately financed project, yeah. uh, which is just doesn't happen today. You know, in Sacramento right now, there's an arena that has a roof on it that's going to open in a year that had $275 million of public money. My favorite example is Detroit. I don't know if anybody here is from Detroit. You know, bankrupt Detroit that has put an equal amount of money, $280 million, into a downtown uh, brand new arena. Yep. Uh, Milwaukee has just decided to do the same thing. So yeah. to do this privately, you need a, you couldn't do it in any yeah. of those cities. It, yeah. You can justify it in San Francisco, but part of the reason you can justify it is the site is 12 acres. So we are building Lots two of office buildings. Office. We are building 125,000 square feet of, of retail in addition to the arena itself. And those other elements are helping to mm -hmm. make the financing of the arena project possible. That's fascinating. What a project. Enormous and complex, right? So, I right. mean, the, the business acumen on top of the, the people to mention, obviously, you've, uh, you are a rangy, a rangy <laughs> leader uh, in your skills. Let me ask a question or two also about um, your coming out as a, as a gay man so high up in the NBA and in the sports kind of industry more generally. Um, the world has changed a lot in this respect. If, if you thought about kind of um, y the point at which you chose to do that and how it was received, were there surprises? Could you comment a little bit on those kinds of questions? We have another four hours? Yeah, that's yeah. a big one. I, I uh, know. That's well, it was a, it, it, you know, uh, it was an interesting point in my life. I, uh, uh, my mother had just been diagnosed with, uh, with lung cancer. I'd, I'd lost my father a couple years before. Uh, was kind of reevaluating my personal situation. I'd lost a, uh, I'd broken up with a partner of 14 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. in large measure because I couldn't include the most important person in my life into my mm -hmm. work life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had just made my own decision at that point. You know what, you know, now's the right time for me. Uh -huh. uh, and I can deal with that. I had, you know, friends, family had always known, always been incredibly supportive, but for whatever reason I'd chosen to keep that out of my work life yeah. and yeah. work environment. Uh, yeah in men's professional sports. And, you know, I, I really hadn't had to decide. I, I was too close to it. Uh, I went to, uh, actually called a friend of mine who ran a big, big PR firm in uh, New York City that I, I really respected his judgment on kind of where stories fit into the bigger scheme of things. And 
asked him to have dinner with me on a snowy night in the Upper East Side. Mm. And he said, like, Dan, like, so here's what I want to do. I can take care of my business privately and everything will be great, but I need somebody to kind of like tell me if I did this in a different way, could yeah. it have more impact yeah. beyond yeah. just my own life? And never forget, he kind of looked across the table at me and goes, Ricky, he goes, you know, if you're prepared to do this, yeah. I want to help you, and I think it's page A1 New York Times. Yeah. That was kind of, <laughs> that, was, that, that was clearly my oh shit moment. Yeah, okay. I would imagine. I mean, like, and he was okay. right. Yeah. Well, but I, I got incredibly lucky. He yeah. connected me with a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, uh, writer for the New York Times, a guy by the name of Dan Barry, came out to Phoenix. And we really, uh, we talked a lot. Now, because I'd done my job fairly well, yeah. nobody knew who I was, right? Yeah. Because... Yeah. If you do my job well, yeah. it's the players yeah. and the coaches. Yeah, that's, and the, yeah. that's what you want people focused yeah, on. If they right. start worrying about the men and women in yeah. the suits in the yeah. office, we probably have some other problems. 49ers might yeah. be an yeah. example right now. <laughs> uh, but, but um, you know, so, so how can we do it? And yeah. you say, well, yeah. like you have been around the most extraordinary people in your life that everyone knows, yeah, right? That's right? So why don't we ask them to tell your story. Wow. So, wow. you know, yeah. the first trip was to get on a plane, go back up to Seattle. Uh, you guys are all so young. I, Bill Russell, does that resonate? 11 championships in 13 years with uh, the Boston Celtics, uh, you know, and go over to Mercer Island, knocked on the door, and the door opens, and, you know. <laughs> there's Bill Russell sitting there with his Boston Celtics hat on, and we went in, you know, sat in his uh, little mm. den, which wasn't intimidating at mm. all, because the only thing between us was a picture from Barack Obama Sign, Bill, you're my inspiration. <laughs> okay. Okay. But uh, Bill, who's you know not a not a media friendly guy, uh, immediately said, "Look, anything I could do." We'd never had that discussion wow. before. Yeah. Uh, wow. You know, and continue that with the then NBA commissioner David Stern, yeah. yeah. two-time MVP Steve Nash, who just yeah. joined the Warriors. Yeah. Uh, you know, and through those people, yeah. the story got told, and yeah. it did end up on the front page of the New York Times, yeah, which uh, I think, you know, thinking back on it, it's only been four and a half years ago. Yeah. Like, I'm not sure, not only would that story not be on the front page of the New York Times, yeah. I'm not sure it would make the New York Times today. It's it might, interesting. But, well, that says a lot about But it does, I, I think, as a measure of progress, yeah. uh, you know, it, it just that is, is something that none of us could have foreseen the societal change that yeah. we've undergone the last uh, four or five years. Completely agree. And so many yeah. courageous acts that, that got us here, right? Yeah. And, and it, these, uh, at the time, were absolutely extraordinary. Even when they're kind of looked at through the lens of today, it's, yeah. it seems uh, maybe they were things that were just inevitable or easy. They, they weren't. They weren't inevitable or easy. Uh, questions from you. Love to, uh, and please use the microphone if you, uh, if you would, because we're videoing and we want to make sure to capture any questions you have. I, have. I have others, and I will continue with mine, but please, I want to make sure the audience gets a chance to ask some questions. Is Steph Curry really that nice a guy? Is, yes. Go ahead. Actually, he is he. A good question. Actually, the answer is no. He's no? Like, he's like twice that good. Twice that good. And it's like, He it's seems good in the family and everything, right? Uh, we all got he's to... A, he's a real testament to great parenting. He has rock star parents. Yeah. He's just... Yeah. Unbelievable parents at and, the games, uh, and yeah, you know we're we're blessed to have that as the centerpiece of our yeah. uh, of our team and great foundation to build. Yeah, around. well, it's yeah. a powerful sort of center of gravity in terms of yep. character, not yeah. just in terms of talent. Yeah. Obviously, the talent is is there too, but yeah. uh, these kind of uh, iconic members of any institution or community that that as you build culture and you build norms and you build a way of of uh, of working in the world, they, they're just incredibly potent. Please. Uh, Rick, thanks for coming out. I'm a big fan of the All-Star Game. I don't know if you want to tell the team here how it was a big effort for you to try to get that going and you know, how, what, what it means to the league today. Uh, well, I'm glad you like it because there's definitely a split opinion at this point. about whether <laughs> Only for like the dunk it. contest. Yeah, well, okay. So my first job, I got hired. I got, I'd worked for the Sonics in Seattle, and I'd kind of gone into business with a couple of partners in Seattle. And I got a call one day from... Uh, somebody at the NBA league office introduced himself as a lawyer, new lawyer there, and uh, said, I, why don't you come back and visit me? I, I kind of have big ideas for what the NBA could be. So like, I got to fly to New York City. I got to stay a night in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, walk over to the Olympic Tower, and sit down with this young lawyer. And 
that half hour meeting went on for about four hours and we realized you know, we had an amazing connection around the NBA. Uh, so I got hired to be the first person, it sounds ridiculous, first person ever to go out and talk to corporate partners about investing marketing dollars in the NBA. We had no, the NBA was about scheduling games and assigning referees up until then. Uh, and I had no idea what a damaged brand the NBA was in 1982 when I got there. I mean, it was so far down the food chain, you couldn't even find it. Teams uh -huh. talking about going out of business, first league that was tainted with widespread rumors of drug use. You know, no, America would never support a league where three quarters of the athletes were African American. Uh, there were a whole bunch of reasons to fail. And uh, so I like was desperate to try to find companies who would actually invest marketing dollars. And I was sitting at home all by myself one night watching the Cracker Jack Old Timers baseball game. It took place in Washington, D.C., 1983. And some 60-year-old guy got up and hit a ball over the Cracker Jack sign in right field. And I'm like, I think I got it. This okay? is so uh, that young lawyer was David Stern. Uh, and from the time I got there and he hired me to a year and a half later, he'd been elected the next commissioner of the NBA. He was going to take, he was going to take office uh, February at the end of the All-Star Weekend, which was taking place in Denver, Colorado. And Denver, those of you who follow our sport know, was a very proud ABA. We're playing them tonight, actually. Proud ABA team before they were part of the NBA. And they're, they hosted something called the ABA Slam Dunk Contest in 1976, which everybody you'll meet in Denver who was alive at the time says they were in McNichols Arena that day and <laughs> saw Julius Irving go to one end of the court, charge down the court, take off from the free throw line. No one had ever seen this before and dunk a basketball. Win the ABA Slam Dunk Contest, instant lore and legend in basketball circles. So we're going to Denver, Stern's becoming commissioner. One of the things that he had said from the day he was elected is like, we've got to get back in touch with the great teams and mm. athletes that mm. created the game. Mm. We've totally lost touch with mm. the history of our game. So I went and I said, I got an idea. Yeah, Let's, right. instead of just doing that one little all-star game, yeah. what if we did a second day yeah. and we could do a slam dunk contest, we could reenact the ABA, famous ABA slam dunk contest, and we could do an old timers game yeah. and bring back all these old slam players dunk. that yeah. we've just kind of turned our backs on. and. Most importantly to me, I think I could actually sell that, okay? So we convinced, this, uh, we convinced this young upstart television network you may have heard of called the Entertainment and Sports Programming Network, <laughs> now, now known as ESPN. They didn't do any live programming at the time, but they did tape events. So they came out. What unfolded that day was magical, what we learned about uh, the difference between baseball and uh, basketball is old-timers games are not really pretty in basketball. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a little... It's really not the way you remembered all those great players, <laughs> those great players. Uh, in their heyday. Uh, but Julius Irving, bless his heart, agreed to come back at the very end of his career and participate uh -huh. in the slam dunk uh -huh. contest again. He was a finalist against Larry Nance, who was a, a rookie in his rookie year. Larry Nance beat him, kind of a passing of the torch. Stern became commissioner the next day, and it really took off from there. It was really a lot of luck, you know, uh, more than anything else, but it, it's now grown into something I can't even describe from an international mm. perspective. That's fantastic. Well, I, I think, you know, the sensibilities of, of seeing an opportunity, right, in the jargon of entrepreneurship, we talk about opportunity recognition, right? And what are the, is, that, is that a gift or is that a skill set? Uh, we believe a lot of it is the latter, and we do the best we can to, to deliver that. But that's, you know, it, it, one gets some sense and says, now, wait a minute, just as you said, I watched that game and said, hey, Anyways, great, great story. Please, Eric. Mr. Welch, thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Abrams. I'm director of diversity initiatives here. And um, you mentioned that when you came to the Warriors, you know, they had not been to the playoffs 17 out of the previous 18 years, and there, there were some very rough years even after you first started. But the fans have always shown up in Oakland. Um, and I think that I've seen some, some studies and some data that show that the fans who show up at the Oakland Arena are some of the most ethnically diverse fans of any yeah. professional sports team that exists in America. When we look at the fan base of, say, the San Francisco Giants, it's very different than the fan base yeah. of, say, the Oakland A's. Do you guys have any plans to do anything to encourage an ethnically diverse fan base to cross the bay? Yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. One, uh, we're going to take all those people with us. Okay. <laughs> and, and I'm really not, I'm really not kidding, because what, what has happened since we announced the move to San Francisco, a couple really important things. One, 
uh, we have capped our season tickets at 14,500. Uh, we have renewed in the last two, this last year 98% of those season ticket holders. And mm -hmm. we've done it with the promise that you're the people who get to have first call uh, on seats in nice. San Francisco. Nice. And in large measure because of that, nice. I think, it, I mean, 4% of people die or move a year, and we're renewing at 98%. I don't know how you do that, right? Uh, and we have 17,500 people who've signed up for a paid waiting list behind that in the hopes that some of those 14,500 people mm -hmm give up their seats. Now, I think all those things are happening because our hope and expectation is the reason people are behaving the way they are, because they have every intention of coming with us. And everything special, which is really special, that atmosphere we created, Oracle Arena, in the oldest facility in the NBA, it's older than Madison Square Garden. We need a new building if we're gonna have mm. a foundation of a franchise going forward. But it's not the building, it's the people who are in the building that make the difference. So we have, we, we really believe that that's gonna travel, that's gonna travel with us. The other thing I would say, which kind of goes back to the Dean's uh, earlier question about building an organization, I had, the, I had the opportunity to build a senior management team really from scratch. Now we found a couple of gems that were hidden in the ex existing organization. But other than that, I got to go out and recruit uh, the faces that will represent the franchise. And I, I put it to any other team to say there's a more gender or ethnically or sexual orientation diverse group of a senior management team at a team in sports. It was important to me personally. I think it's really important that we demonstrate that to our players who are our most important employees. Uh, th that the faces they see in the league office are faces that, that they can resonate with. Um, you know, and whether it's, you know, really, I, I'm so proud of that. And I think it, I, it's an organizational imperative for us to do that. And I think it's very reflective of, you're right, our, our audience is, is very diverse at, uh, at Oracle Arena, but, uh, but we're bringing them with us to San Francisco. Good question. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Suresh, yeah. With us here. Uh, Congratulations on the land purchase, first of all. Thank it's you. Great, great to see that, and uh, big fan. I was at Game 2. I'll be there this Thursday. All right. My questions are on big data and analytics as it rel relates to our students. So we've seen the sport of baseball, how it's transposed, where now literally defenses are shifting on every single batter, evidenced by the Pirates, obviously with Billy Bean and Sabermetrics. And I've seen some of that shift in some of the offices in the football, like Parag down at the Niners, and have friends that have now gone to work for offices. I'm curious, how is the NBA approaching Big data, do you see yourself and other executives starting to employ MBAs in using analytics or, or, or is the industry gonna continue to, how is it evolving, I guess is the question. Big, biggest opportunity and Thanks. biggest growth area in sports and MBA is, is right there. I, you know, I, 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 I love to listen to really smart people, much smarter than me, talk about the difference between football or difference between baseball and basketball. I think the easiest explanation is uh, it's a little more challenging from an analytics perspective because baseball is like a, describe it as a two-dimensional game. There's a play as, you know, a pitcher, a batter, and a fielder, right? NBA, you have 10 players in motion at the same time on a court and is a much more complex uh, system to analyze. But, but our organization is one of the ones that uh, is devoting a ton of time, resources to gathering a lot of analytic data. Now, you know, I would say that, that that's good. It's helped us very much in terms of suggestions to the coaching staff in terms of combinations of players, things like that, that, that in certain situations appear to have the, the highest level of productivity. But, you know, I, I would say on the coaching side, it's a little slower to adapt because, you know, they're used to a system where their eye tells them pretty much everything they need to know. I think where we're the breakthrough for us is going to be in, in a lot of the wearable technology, the biometrics mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. are impossible to argue with. Uh, yeah. We rested uh, Steph Curry a couple games last year and Andre Iguodala a couple games in the regular season last year solely based on the biometric data that we wow. collected during uh, wow. practices yeah. uh, because we, we believe we could show mm -hmm. a recovery mm -hmm. uh, in their performance after you know, even just a day's rest. And you got what you found, I mean, what you yeah. were looking for. And, yeah, and yeah. so that, yeah. you know, then coaches kind of go, okay. okay. yeah. Like, well, he's, a, he's a lot better today than he was two days yeah. ago. That, yeah. 
there might be something to this. Well, that's and a great example. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of in baseball, right? Part of it was look proof in the pudding, right? Yeah. That people saw results and said we got to pay a little more attention. But to that. but yeah. in our sport, of course, or soccer, conditioning is is such yeah. a key component of performance yeah. that that. If it's run uh, down. But it's you know it's not uncomplicated you know well i'm sure you know this next round of collective bargaining there's going to be a lot of discussion about what we have the right to know yeah. uh you about. know about the medical condition of our players and oh. what is considered to be private information well, isn't that that, that person should have so yeah. you know yeah. our focus is on health and performance and believing we can have healthier players do better well. but you know, it's it's not without peril. Boy, that's a great a great point about just how how deep into one's personal life can we go as we go into biometrics. That's a great point. Please. Hi. So Hi. one of the biggest fans of the team is sitting right here. Her name is Bomi Kim. And in the last year since she moved from Korea, I think she's been to more games than sixty percent of the class combined. Awesome. <laughs> so nice how do you it. think about your international fan base? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we have the three largest Asian communities, three of the five largest Asian communities in the United States in, in San Francisco, Oakland, and in uh, San Jose. So we, we uh, you know, we're uh, focused across a lot of different areas on our international fan base, but, but Asia more than any other. Um, our, our Filipino Heritage Nights are the biggest. We actually do two of them a year. Uh, unbelievably successful. We took the Warriors to China. Uh, two years ago, played the Lakers in both Beijing and uh, Shanghai, and we may be scheduled to go back there in a short period of time that we haven't announced yet. Uh, and that, that's not only important in growing the, uh, the game of basketball internationally, but home. I mean, you know, a lot of that strategy is just based on positioning ourselves. We were the first team in sports ever uh, to create a special uniform for the Lunar New Year, for Chinese New Year mm. last year. And we wore that, I think, six games, uh, including national television games last year. We're doing that again this year. Mm. So, uh, but it's, you know, it's not confined to the Asian community either. The, the league has a huge initiative in February around Black History Month. Uh, you know, I think, you know, the whole, sports is like the greatest place in the world where truly it really is only how good you are at what you do for a living that determines how successful you are, right? If you think about, if you think about sports, I mean, it, it's the best place. It's why it also becomes a place for social discussion too, because we can talk about things in the context of sports that we share in common that we may have a difficult time talking about, you know, just mm -hmm. as friends. And you know, sports has always been a lightning rod for those conversations in our society, whether it's you know black players coming into our league, whether it's sexual orientation, whether it's HIV. I mean, one of the proudest experiences in my professional career was we had about, at the NBA, we had about uh, three days notice uh, that Magic Johnson was going, uh, had, been, had been found to be HIV positive. And, you know, it's almost impossible to think of what we didn't know about HIV uh, when Magic did that in 1993. Is that right? 1994. Uh, and, you know, we had three days to figure it all out. Could, mm -hmm. could you play? Could you, are you endangering mm -hmm. other players by mm -hmm. playing on a basketball court? Uh, you know, the doctors, the PR people, everybody hunkering down in, in our offices. And, you know, it was a, it was a world changing event mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. none of us knew anybody up until that point who was HIV positive, And then everybody in the world knew somebody they not only knew, but loved, mm -hmm. who was standing up with this unbelievable courage. And, yeah. you know, a month later we're doing, we're doing television specials on Nickelodeon about HIV. They'd never said HIV out loud yeah. on Nickelodeon yeah. before, yeah. right? Yeah. And it, it changed the dialogue uh, in the world, but yeah. it took the power of sports mm -hmm. to actually do that. Well, when you make that point too, I mean, the, the sports has been a platform for so long. The Olympics, right? The 70s yeah. and 80s, and some of the discussions around the Olympics, we've always, it's always yeah. been a, an important platform for larger discussions. Um, other questions here, please. I'm, I've, got, I've got one I wanted to ask you. When you think about uh, sort of your leadership style, if somebody were to say, here's what it's like to work with and, and for Rick, what, <laughs> what's... You know, I, like I, the, the, my greatest skill in my life was picking great bosses. Hmm. That's what I tell, you know, just if you want some great advice, go pick great bosses. Because I, I have taken 
elements, I think, of each of them and applied them to my own personality, my own character in a way that, that I could take what I thought was the best of other people, not try to do it the way they did it. I think you're destined yeah. to fail if you try to emulate somebody yeah. completely and do it exactly the way they did it, but to try to you know, pick the things that I admired most and the leaders that I work for and adapt them myself. I think we're really collaborative. Uh, you know, I'm not a yeller or screamer, yeah. but we hold people accountable to, to what they do. We give them the resources to succeed and hold them accountable for the results. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I, I am a keep calm and carry on guy. You oh. know, I don't think you see me frazzled in any situation, yeah. but, uh, you know, it, it's, kind of true to my nature, it's true to who I am. Mm. Uh, but I, I could tell you, you know, from every boss that I've worked for, something that I have tried to make a part of, of how I act around people professionally in organizations. That's great, great. Well, obviously there's, there's plenty of intensity too uh, <laughs> in, in the system, but I think that's important. This is more on the coaching side, but there's actually a business school case around Coach Knight versus Coach K, right? It's sort of like two radically different college uh, coaching styles, both terrifically successful, right? right? But, uh, exactly. but the idea that, that many different styles can work in many different ways, yeah. but uh, please. Eric, thanks for uh, being with, your, with us today. You. Um, when you guys fired Mark Jackson, to me that was probably the, one of the strongest and maybe only examples of a time when a professional sports team really kind of didn't settle for good enough, or as we like to say here at Haas, uh, question the status quo. I got you, Dean Lyons. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I think it was a risky move, too, because you were right. coming from a coach who had led the team to two consecutive playoff berths to Steve Kerr, who had never been a head coach before. Can you just right. tell us what that decision-making process was like and the kind of team it takes to make that kind of decision, go against the grain, and do something that probably most other teams would never even think about doing? Yeah. No, I, actually, thank you for asking the question. It's a, it was a huge head scratcher for a lot of people outside of our organization. But uh, those of you who aren't familiar with the situation, Mark Jackson uh, was a broadcaster, great player, broadcaster, uh, never coached a game before that we hired to, to be head coach of the Warriors. Took the Warriors uh, to two consecutive playoff bursts, which, as I explained to you, the yeah, Warriors hadn't made the playoffs there. in 17 out of 18 years. Uh, changed the culture of the locker room, created a winning culture in the locker room, yet we didn't, we thought there was more that could have been achieved with, with mm. the talent that we had put together. So mm. incredibly difficult decision. A good guy, like, you know, a genuinely good human being. Uh, but, you know, I had a little bit of a head start with Steve Kerr. I, uh, he was the general manager of the Phoenix Suns for three years when I was the president of the Phoenix Suns and had become a really incredibly close friend. He never really wanted to be a general manager who really only his whole life wanted to be a coach. And uh, if it hadn't been for having young, younger kids would have done it earlier in his career. So, but, but you're, it, it was a pretty funny dialogue and you have to remember the timing of this. So we were in the playoffs with Mark Jackson's team, right? With our, with our Warriors team. The Knicks, the dreaded Knicks, of course, were not in the playoffs because they're never in the playoffs, right? <laughs> and they had, they had hired Phil Jackson, the famous Phil Jackson, uh, to be their head coach. And, you know, we're sitting here trying to decide, depending upon what happened at the end of the season, whether or not Mark would continue as coach. So we weren't in the market for a coach at the moment. And Phil Jackson pretty much announced to the world that Steve Kerr, was his choice to lead the uh, New York Knicks going forward. Um, and, you know, so we're, we're thinking, you know, Steve is really the guy, yeah. you know, we really, if we're gonna make a change, he's the guy, but play it out. Like, yeah. okay, let's get this right. So <laughs> you hired a broadcaster who never coached the, a team before, who took you to two consecutive playoff bursts, but you fired him to hire a broadcaster who's <laughs> never coached a team before, <laughs> and you're expecting a better result. That was not a great backdrop to the decision until Phil Jackson kind of saved us. Like, Forced instead of, it, yeah. you know, he had anointed Steve yeah. as the next coach of the New York Knicks, and the, and the, you know, the story became, oh my God, this guy chose the Warriors over the New York Knicks, not what I said before. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we got a little bit lucky, good example. Uh, but I, you know, listen, you never know till you put a guy out there on the sidelines how good a coach he's gonna be. What I did know is, you know, the quality of 
the human being that we were selecting. And this is mm. one of the most amazing people, forget sports or any other mm. most amazing people I've ever been around. And, and uh, while you can never be sure, I'm not surprised at the uh, success that he yeah. had last year. Well, being a great people picker for people in seats like yours and yeah. many others, right? It yeah. it's, could be one of the, the most fundamental, please. What is the Warriors' stance on female coaches? So we have folks like Becky Hammond for the Spurs is doing quite well. Yeah. How's the Warriors? What what is the Warriors' thought on well, that? Well, I'm so excited for her. Um, you know, I think for Greg Popovich, kind of the dean of NBA coaches, to be the guy who who made that decision, I think was incredibly impactful uh, in an organization that's known for success. Uh, and you know, I I think that that it's the tip of the iceberg, I really do. You know, I'm, I, you know, on my resume, the, one of the things in the 18 minute introduction that the Dean didn't mention was, uh, you know, being a real key uh, part of uh, founding the WNBA. And, you know, to me, that right is right there at the top of my list in terms of achievements. It's gonna celebrate its 20th season next year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I'm incredibly proud of having been part of that. Uh, I think, you know, the NBA has had uh, a much better track record on uh, gender diversity uh, through every job with the exception of on the floor of the basketball team, right? So uh, there's a couple reasons for that. I, I don't think it's any innate goodness in us, although I think it's, it's thoughtful. Uh, you know, compared to football and, and baseball who've had such long successful histories, the NBA is really relatively new in its success. So the people that we hired as we grew organizations tended to be much more reflective of society at that moment in time than, you know, these kind of ingrained organizations that, that uh, didn't have that opportunity to grow and, and, and draw from kind of a current population. So I'm, I, I think it's great. You know, I think uh, I noticed on the NFL game, like I took a double take at the NFL game last night, there was a female official on the field last night. Huh. I'm like, how cool is that? Huh. Um, but, you know, ultimately it's yeah. about, you know, and then the way we found the WNBA, it has to be about achievement. It's, 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 you can start the process by trying to do the right thing, but ultimately, because we're in the industry we are, you gotta really be able to do the job. And that's, that's, you know, that's what I'm most proud of with Becky. Is I think she's she really doing the job. Uh, Sacramento Kings just hired Nancy Lieberman to be an assistant coach uh, in Sacramento. So, you know, one, then two, then there'll be a lot more. Thanks. How about in the remaining, we just have a few more minutes, if you could talk a little bit about, so I know advice is always hard to give, and we have <laughs> lots of different people in the audience with different, their own different pathways, but are there a few spots that were real inflection points in your own career as you moved? I mean, you were obviously involved in the NBA, NBA from, from way back, but, but you, you took, took a path that got you to arrive at a place where clearly you're finding your best energy. A couple of things that happened to you that might be useful for us to know as, as advice. You know, I, th I think I was like destined to do this. Yeah. I, 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 my father and I had a relationship where sports was our currency, right? That's, that's, lost, <laughs> lost the mic. That's what we did together. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. yeah. I'm back. Got it. Uh, that's what we did together. That's yeah. how, that's how we talked to each other. We went to games together. We talked about what happened last night. I yeah. mean, yeah. so it was kind of like a really important part of my family yeah. life as well. My dad, I was a, very mediocre athlete. My dad was like a superstar athlete. He was awesome. So uh, the Sonics were the first uh, professional team to come to Seattle, and they started playing in 1967. And we started going to the games. And I found something more that I hadn't found before. It wasn't just like these great players doing amazing things athletically. It was like everything mm, else. Yeah, like yeah, we had an arena. Nice. We had 14,000 people cheering there and there was like this is it's really than that. yeah this is there's really something going on here that I want to be a part of and mm -hmm. uh, you know I think if you kind of have that in your mind every little step every little decision you make whether you're doing it consciously or not gets you a little closer to That's that and uh, you know I, I I think the only advice I could give anybody is really find something you're passionate about mm -hmm. because if you really are passionate about what you do when you wake up every day, 
uh, like you really never work a day in your life, yeah. right? That's the yeah. old expression, yeah. but it's really true. You know, it like I, I pinch myself, you know, driving across the bridge every morning mm -hmm. to Oakland to, to the office saying like, president of an NBA team, like how cool is that? How much, how right? much fun, <laughs> right? how much so, fun, is, how much fun this? is that, right? Most days. Like most, most days. days. Most days. Most days. Most yeah. days. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, Rick Welts and the Golden State Warriors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.